Please let's turn our Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. We'll be reading verse 6 through, nine, uh, through 10. Colossians chapter 2 from verse 6 to 10. So I read. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to open up your word, O oh Lord, and to study at your feet. Father, Lord, our prayer this morning, O oh God, is that even as your word comes forth, Lord, let it come with light and understanding even unto us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, Lord, in the areas of confusion which we may be struggling with, Father, Lord, let your word bring clarity in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, in the areas, O oh Lord, that we are seeing darkness, we are seeing occlusion, we are seeing blindness of any sort, Father, Lord, we pray that your word will open our eyes to your truth this morning in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, let your word not leave us the same in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you will take all the glory this morning, for your name alone is worthy of praise. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 The title of our message today is Rooted in Christ. Rooted in Christ. So turning back to Colossians chapter 2, in our reading, we see that Apostle Paul uses the metaphor of root, of a tree root to exhort the Colossian church on how to walk and grow in Christ. So the Apostle Paul uses the word roots. So if we turn back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. From verse 6, we see, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Verse 7 says, rooted. And that is sort of where we are anchoring on today. He uses the word root to exhort the Colossian church on how to walk and grow in Christ. The benefit of using the metaphor of the root system of trees, the root system of trees, is that uh, most of us are probably familiar with that. Most of us have a basic understanding of the importance of roots in trees, in plants and in trees. And no doubt the Colossian church also had a basic understanding of the role of roots, what it means to be rooted, the importance of that for trees. So if you've done any form of You've taken any basic science or you've done any form of gardening or you've actually just tried to grow a seed, you understand the importance of roots. So it's with that basis that we'll examine this word rooted, rooted in Christ that we see here in verse 7. The apostle uses the word to indicate that just as for a tree, for a tree to grow well, for a tree to grow well, it needs to be rooted in good soil. By the same token, for a Christian, a Christian who desires spiritual growth has to also be rooted in Christ Jesus. This is the analogy that uh, the apostle is trying to make us see here. That for a tree to grow well, it needs to be rooted in good soil. By the same token, any Christian who desires spiritual growth must be rooted in Christ, in Christ Jesus. And so in the remainder of our time, it was consider this issue on three points. One is what is the meaning of being rooted in Christ? What does it mean to be rooted in Christ? What are we talking about here? And what are the benefits of being rooted in Christ? And the final point is an admonition, an exhortation, an encouragement for us to that there is a need for us to continue to be rooted in Christ, to grow our roots in Christ. So first, we will consider the meaning of what it means to the meaning of being rooted in Christ. We'll consider the benefits and then an admonition for us to continue our growth in Christ. The Lord will help us this morning in Jesus' name. So what does it mean to be rooted in Christ? What does it mean to be rooted in Christ? 
Apostle Paul, from verse 6 of Colossians chapter 2, we see that Apostle Paul is sort of drawing a point that the process of being rooted in Christ is something that starts right after you receive Christ through the process of salvation. So for an individual to be rooted in Christ, we are not talking about sinners. A sinner cannot start thinking about being rooted in Christ. A sinner still has to go first through the process of salvation. It's after you've received Christ that the natural next step is that you start growing in Christ. You start thinking about being rooted in Christ. I mean, it's the same thing. When we plant a seed in the ground, the first natural step for that seed is for it to start yielding roots, start growing roots, and trying to grow those roots into the soil. By the same token, a Christian or someone who is new, who has just been saved, who has just been redeemed, who has just experienced salvation, that person needs the very next step. You don't just remain at that point. The very next step is for you to start growing into Christ, growing your roots into Christ. But why, why, do, we, why do I, I mean, I find it very useful, you know, in studying, in, in, in preparing for this message, to view the state of a Christian who has just been saved as that of a seed. In other words, a Christian, at the points of salvation, you are just like a seed. Why? Why is that a good thing to say? Well, the Bible teaches us that salvation does one thing. It puts to death the old man in us, the old nature that we had, the old self that we have. That is what salvation does. It crucifies it. Romans 6 verse 6, let's quickly read that. Romans 6 verse 6 makes this very clear. It says that knowing this, that our old man or our old nature or our old self was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. In other words, what we used to be prior to the point of salvation is now dead. It has been done away with. It turns out to be all that we know, all that we knew up to that point in time. It has been done away with. Ephesians 4, 21 and 22 also says the same thing talks about putting away the old nature. And the reason for that is that the old self, we can liken that to a bad tree, as Jesus talks about in Matthew 7 and 17, where he says that the good tree bears good fruits and the bad tree bears bad fruits, Matthew 7, 17. So the power of salvation is to crucify the old sinful nature and replace it with a good seed that has the potential to now grow into Christ. It does away with the old nature, the old self, all that we knew up to that point in time. It does away with it and it replaces it with a good seed that has a potential. And that's why in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, the Bible tells us that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are done away with. That old nature that we knew all that was your existence up to the point of salvation has to be done away with. It's done away with. Now we are dealing with a new creature. What else is a good analogy for a good creature than a seed? Galatians 2 verse 20 tells us that, uh, that you know, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. But not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's talking about a new life, the beginning of a new life. And that is what a seed recognize um, symbolizes so we think about a new christian as a seed so at that point in time then there's a question of growth like we said for a seed the next natural step for a seed is to grow roots a seed that does not grow roots is basically remains a seed and it dies so we have to now start growing roots. And the reason, the purpose for growing roots is that we need to know that we need to now grow into a new nature, into a new Christ-like nature. A Christ-like nature that is complete opposite of our old sinful nature. And so what Apostle Paul is making us realize here is that the ability to grow into this new nature is only possible in Christ. It's only possible when we are rooted in Christ. We do not grow into a new Christ-like nature by studying books, by getting degrees, by listening to wise men, or by convincing ourselves that we need to do it. But rather, it's only possible in Christ. And this is why we need, this is what 
being rooted in Christ is all about. Recognizing that need. That from the point of salvation onwards, we would not make any progress unless we recognize that we have to be rooted in Christ. Because at this point, we have to put aside all sinful habits. And anyone who has experienced salvation knows that it is not easy of your own strength to put away old sinful habits. I can testify to that. Of your own strength, you cannot stop all that was sinful that you did before. You may chant as many uh, mantras, you may, you may chant as many uh, seven-step points or ten-step points as you wish. It is not going to be effective. You cannot of your own strength. It's beyond human strength to put away old sinful habits. But we thank God that he did not intend for us to transform ourselves in our own strength. God did not intend for us to transform ourselves in our own strength. That is why in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it tells us that we, that, that we, sh- we don't need to transform ourselves. Let's quickly read that going back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Verse 9 and 10 says, For in Christ, in him, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Let's quickly turn to that. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It tells us that as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain, pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So in other words, all that we need to grow into this new Christ-like nature is already available and provided for us in Christ himself. And so then we go back to our analogy then of a tree growing. So we see that for a tree, for it to grow, it has to trust completely in the soil because its roots grow into the soil. It trusts that by growing into the soil, it will find all the sustenance that it needs for it to grow. By the same token, we as children of God, we should trust in Christ that by growing into him, trusting completely in him, putting our hope in him, we can grow up into God's purposes for our lives. We can grow into God's purposes for our lives. So you see, the the tree grows its roots deep and wide into the soil. It doesn't grow upwards. It doesn't partially grow into the ground and partially into the air. It grows completely. It puts its complete trust into the soil. By the same token, for our spiritual growth as Christians, we need to put our complete trust in Christ. We need to grow rooted in him. We have to be like a seed that is seeking, digging deep with its roots into Christ, knowing that all that we need for godliness and life is available in him. Pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So a couple of points on that. We're still talking about what it means to be rooted in Christ. It means that we need to recognize that for us to grow as Christians, we have to grow like the seed, grow our roots into Christ couple of points on that. So how can we grow into Christ? First, it means that we need to study and meditate on the scriptures as if our life and our very existence depends on it. And actually, literally, our spiritual life depends on it. We need to study and meditate on the scriptures like our life and our existence, our very existence depends on it. And it turns out that our spiritual life actually depends on it. Because we are, without the scriptures, we do not have a spiritual life. Jesus says that the words that he speaks are what? They are spirit and they are life. It is impossible to have a spiritual life without growing, in meditating, and, and studying the scripture. Because there's no other way for us to know what it is that God requires of us. What does godly living mean? What kind of life is pleasing to God? Where can we find answers to these sort of questions? The Bible tells us in Micah 6 verse 8 that the Lord himself has revealed to us what he requires of us. And 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us that we should study ourselves to become approved of God. To be approved of God means that for, for us to live a life that is pleasing to God. So the first point is we need to study and meditate on the scriptures because our spiritual life literally depends on it. 
The second point is for us to, to, our goal in life is to please God in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. Because that is the very essence of the new nature in Christ. Jesus Christ said this repeatedly, I do not come to do of my own will, but to do the will of the Father. Over and over again, he says that I do not do my own will. I do what the Father wants me to do. And that is the essence of a, Christ, of a, of a Christ nature life. As Christians, when we want to grow to this, our goal is to please God in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And this is not easy. Because we live in times where men crave the approval of other men more than anything else. Especially in the, area, in the, in, in, in the age of the social media. How many of us can relate to this experience of you post something on your social media and then you wait with bated breath to see whether your friends are going to give you thumbs up or thumbs down? You wait all day, hoping people will say something positive and they won't, you know, criticize you for what you've posted. This is the age we live in. You know, like 20, 30 years ago, you know, you, you probably just shared your ideas with the people who were around you, your friends, people you could see. But now with social media, you have friends that span the entire globe. You have followers in the hundreds and the thousands and the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. And so when you go and you post something, you are waiting, you hope they will like it. You hope they won't criticize it. You hope they will retweet it with a thumbs up. And sometimes that can just mask and cover all what we do, think, and say. In other words, when we start thinking, when we start talking, when we start acting, we act in, in, with the expectation, with the, with, with the concern about how will other people judge what I say. It's a very easy thing to fall into. But the Bible tells us, teaches us that we should be God-pleasers and not men-pleasers. We should be God-pleasers and not men-pleasers. We can see an example here in Acts chapter 4, verse 19. With the early church. You can see an example with the early church, Acts chapter 4, verse 19, where Peter and John, after they had, they had healed the man who was, who was lame by the temple, and they, had, they started preaching, preaching the name of Christ, and then the religious leaders of the day called them and told them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And in verse, four, in, in verse 19 of Acts chapter 4, we see the reply of Peter and John. Peter, but Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Acts 5, 29, the same thing comes up again. But Peter and other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5, 29. So in other words, even from the very beginning of the church, the church was already dealing with this issue in terms of what we say, what we think, what we do. Who are we trying to please? Are we trying to please God or are we trying to please men? In Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, Apostle Paul also puts it this way. Galatians 1 verse 10, he says there that, For, I, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. In other words, Apostle Paul is telling us here that there is just no middle ground here. As children of God, we can choose either to please God or we can choose to please the world. There is no straddling. There is no middle point here. There is no sitting on the fence here. And so if we want to be rooted in Christ... Our utmost goal and objective is to please God in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. I pray the Lord will help us in that in Jesus' name. So having looked at what it means to be rooted in Christ, which is the recognition that after the point of salvation for our spiritual growth, for us to move forward in, 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 in our spiritual life, we need to grow as a seed would grow, grow into Christ. We need to meditate on the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. We need to seek to please God in all that we do. The second point is what are the benefits? What are the benefits of being rooted in Christ? And so we turn back to our text, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. In verse 7, we see here the apostle actually lists out three points, three reasons, three benefits of being rooted in Christ. So I'll read verse 7 again rooted and built up in him, 
and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. We see three points here. The first point is that those who are rooted in Christ are actually built up in Christ. What does that mean? That means they experience continually a healthy and fruitful spiritual growth according to God's purposes for their lives. That means constantly they are growing spiritually. Constantly they are bearing fruits spiritually according to God's purposes for their lives. We can see a similar thing with trees. A tree that starts from a seed that has a good soil, has good roots, grows well in its roots. It grows first down into the roots, deep and wide. That tree then will now manifest on the outward. It will grow tall. It will have healthy barks, healthy branches, healthy leaves, and bear healthy fruits. It's the same, talk, it's the same, it's the same idea. Those who are rooted in Christ will grow. They will grow in good works and in spiritual maturity. The second benefit that the apostle lists here is that they'll be established in the faith. Those who are rooted in Christ will be established in the faith. What this means is that those who are rooted in Christ, for those who are rooted in Christ, their faith will not be shaken or lost by situations in life. They will not lose their faith because of heresies. They will not lose their faith because of tribulations. They will not lose their faith because of persecutions or any other kind of circumstance, whether it's good or bad. The apostle says he had learned how to abase and abound. Their faith is not subject to the circumstances that they are in. And we can see this similar to trees. Trees with good roots are able to sustain winds, the fiercest of winds and storms that will uproot all the other trees around them. Trees that have a good root system that goes deep and wide, no matter how fierce the wind is, they will stand up straight. They will not be damaged. In fact, it's well established that the, 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 the survival of a particular tree depends very much on how well its roots are deep in the ground. So a tree that might grow very fast, very tall, but has very shallow roots, once a little bit of wind comes, it would actually fall. But a tree that takes time to grow deep first, grow deep, establish a solid foundation, that tree, when the winds come, when the storms come, that tree will remain standing. And Apostle Paul can tell us about this because he knew, you know, a few things about the forces, the challenges that come against the Christian faith. Apostle Paul knew a few things about that. Apostle Paul knew what it meant to be on the trial. He knew what it meant to face tribulations in ways perhaps none of us have, or maybe a few of us may have. He, knows, he knew what it meant to face persecutions and all manners of trouble. Let's see, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. Apostle Paul here says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And if we jump forward to verse 16 to 18, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Apostle Paul knows a thing or two about the things that war against your faith and my faith. Apostle Paul knows a thing about the deception 
that Satan might throw your way. We see in, in uh, going back to our main text, Second Col uh, Colossians chapter 2. Let's read verse 9. Verse 8, 2 Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says here, Beware lest anyone cheat you through, through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Here is walk, warning against deception. And the reason for that is that, you know, sometimes what Satan cannot achieve through brute force, he can achieve through deception. What he cannot achieve through brute force, he will achieve through deception. I mean, history is full of churches, individual Christians, and entire ministries that have been just swayed away by heresies, by false doctrines. I mean, we might know this, this, um, this old folk tale about, you know, the wind and the sun. The wind and the sun entering into a competition. Because there was this traveler who was traveling, and he had his coat on. And the wind says to the sun, look, look, that man is, you know, is wearing, it's, it's, a, it's a cold day, he's holding on to his coat. I bet that I could blow that man's coat off. I could force that man to, to drop his coat. I could take it away from him. And so the sun says, like, well, I think I can do it. And then so they have a competition. Who can get the man to lose his coat? And so the wind goes first. And the wind blows. And it blows. And the harder he blows, the harder the man holds on to his coat. The man grips his coat like his life depended on it. The harder the wind blew, the man held on to his coat. And so the wind had to give up. The man was not going to let go of his coat. And so the sun was like, okay, now my turn. And so the sun shines bright and hot and very hot and very, very hot. And then the man takes off his coat, takes off his clothing as well. Because it's very hot. The moral is that what Satan cannot accomplish through brute force, he will do through cunning. And so as much as we are, we are worried of persecutions and trials and tribulations, let us also be on guard against heresies, against false doctrines. When Satan came to Eve, he did not threaten her. He did not threaten her to take, to eat of that fruit. It did not appear to her in a very scary form. He came and he reasoned with her. He said to her and he pointed out to her something that seemed pleasing. The Bible said that after he had finished his persuasion, the tree looked pleasing to the eye. So I pray the Lord will help us. And one of the benefits of being rooted in Christ, having a solid grasp of basic doctrine, is that even when the world comes with things that might seem persuasive and seem nice and make sense, the Word of God that is in us will help us to reject such doctrines so that we will not fall prey to heresies. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So three, re three, three reasons or three benefits as we're reading here from the Apostle of the benefits of being rooted in Christ. First, we've seen that those who are rooted in Christ will be built up in Christ. They will actually experience spiritual growth. The second reason is that they are established in the faith. They are not shaky. They are not swept away by the winds of either heresy of the, or persecution. The third point we see here, reading from verse 7 of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7 says, as you have been taught, so I'm jumping ahead, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. The third point is those who are rooted in Christ abound in thanksgiving. What this means is that for those who are rooted in Christ, their sense of joy, peace, and thanksgiving is not determined by their circumstances. Those who are rooted, firmly rooted in Christ, their sense of joy, peace, and thanksgiving is not determined by their circumstances, but rather it is constant through Christ. It is constant through Christ. You know, this is similar, like, you know, as I was studying, this is similar to the evergreen trees that we see around us. We are privileged to live in a state that is called the evergreen state. And so we know that we, you know, we have four seasons in this country, and we are in the beautiful season of fall, where what happens is that 
the leaves, the leaves actually fall. <laughs> the leaves actually fall. They change color and they fall. But you might notice that there are some trees that still remain green. They are called the evergreen trees. And there are all kinds of them. And there's a question of why is it that they, while other trees are shedding their leaves, while other trees have their leaves changing color, why is it that the evergreen trees are able to retain their green leaves? Studies show that it's because of their root system as well. They have a good root system, that, and they're able to sustain nourishment throughout the year. And so what happens is that they tend to shed a little bit of leaf throughout the year, but not a lot. So they shed a little bit throughout the year, but not a lot. So in other words, they are in a constant system. They have a consistent system that keeps them evergreen. And by the same token, those who are rooted in Christ are also constantly, consistently have a sense of joy, peace, and thanksgiving that comes through Christ. They are not excited today because they won the lottery and then sad tomorrow because they lo- it turns out they didn't actually win it. They read the ticket number wrong. <laughs> No, they are not up today and then down tomorrow. God remains God in their lives regardless of their circumstances. Christ remains the Lord of their life regardless of what it is that they are going through. And that's why in John 14 verse 27, John 14 verse 27, Jesus talks about giving us a peace. He says, he gives us my peace I give to you, not as the peace of the world. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And, and Apostle Paul also in Philippians 4, verse 7 tells us that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. The reason it surpasses all understanding is because it's not subject to circumstances. You see, in the world, it makes sense for you to be happy when things are going well. And it makes sense to be sad when things are not going well. It makes sense not to be troubled when your business is running well. And it makes sense to be troubled when it seems like the market is not responding well. But for those who are rooted in Christ, those who have chosen to grow into Christ, for them, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the circumstance is. So while all those around may be losing hope because of the storms of life, and there are always storms in life, Christians are at peace because Christ dwells in them. The Lord help us with these words in Jesus' name. So we've seen three benefits that the apostle points out here. First, it tells us that those who are rooted in Christ will be built up in Christ. It tells us also that those who are rooted in Christ, their faith will be established in their faith. And finally, it tells us that they will abound in thanksgiving. And so we now go on to our third point, which is our admonition and our encouragement to continue to grow roots in Christ. Let us continue to grow like the seed grows, grows root. Let us continue to grow in Christ. So why do we need to do this? First of all, we started out by saying that this whole idea of growing roots in Christ, being rooted in Christ, is something that starts at the very point of salvation. Because for the sinner, being rooted in Christ makes no sense. Because they are still in the old nature. It's only after the point of salvation when you are now such as a seed. You need to start thinking about growing your roots in Christ. So it's very easy for for someone to focus on that and say that, well, this particular message, this particular admonition is only for the babes in Christ. It's not for the mature in Christ. Say, well, I've been a Christian for so many decades. I... You know, I don't think this is for me. I want to say that please listen and listen well. 
this message is for everyone. Because one thing, as we will see, is that there is no such thing as a fully matured Christian on this side of eternity. There is no such thing as a fully matured Christian on this side of eternity. And we'll listen to Apostle Paul as he puts it so beautifully. So puts it so beautifully in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 16, which is where we'll wrap up today. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. So let's read it first, and then we'll spend the rest of our time in it. So this is Apostle Paul speaking. And, um, and I want us to just consider what he is saying here. When we consider what it means to be a mature Christian, to be a, a, a grown Christian, uh, an experienced Christian, let us think about who Apostle Paul is, and let us listen to what he is saying here. He says here from verse 12 that not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this in mind. And, in, in, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be, uh, let us be of the same mind. Apostle Paul here is calling to all Christians, and he's saying of himself that he does not think he is attained. He is pressing onward in his growth in Christ. He is pressing onward in his growth in Christ. So, we'll use our analogy of the tree. And we'll start out by considering two questions. Two questions. The first question which I'm going to throw out to you. is first is, do trees ever stop growing taller? Anyone want to answer that question? Do trees ever stop growing vertically? In other words, taller. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yes, trees do reach a maximum height and they stop growing. They don't grow any taller. The second question, do trees ever stop growing? No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, sir, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, trees stop growing taller, but they never stop growing. In fact, there was a study in 2014 by a bunch of scientists, and they looked at 700,000 700, trees across, um, I think it was 16 nations. And what they found out was that trees actually never stop growing. They never stop growing. Their heights, they may cap out in terms of their heights, but they never stop growing. So you could ask, what is going on? They found out that they grow wider. They pack on more and more mass. They grow wider and wider. And at the same time, the roots continue to grow. Because you see, there's an interesting thing. If you want to estimate the length of the root of a tree, it turns out that you can actually estimate it based on the width of the trunk. There's an actual formula where you look at the width of the trunk and you can use that to estimate how wide or how long the roots of the tree is. And even not much more than that, and I'm going to quote now from this particular study. So the scientist says, and we are not talking about the tree equivalent of an aging crowd with beer guts. So in other words, when they say trees continue to grow, they're not talking about you know, human beings. The way we human beings, we do stop growing taller, but we continue to grow, but we grow in all kinds of interesting ways. <laughs> Instead, they said all trees are more like active, healthy bodybuilders. All trees are like active bodybuilders, old, healthy, active bodybuilders. In fact, one of the scientists says that it's almost as if, imagine in your favorite sports team, that all the superstars there are like 90-year-olds because they continue to grow actively, building the bodybuilding, and they are very fit. Of course, that's not the analogy in human, for human beings. But just imagine that. So what is this for us 
if we consider ourselves to be mature Christians. And what is this for what Apostle Paul says about pressing onward? Here he's making the point that the older you are in Christ, and actually one final point that I should mention that the scientists observed is that actually it turns out that the older the trees are, the faster they grow. That was actually the one that actually struck me. The old, so older trees grow faster than younger trees. That's like reverse of what happens with humans. Old trees grow faster than younger trees. So here's the point. The older you are in Christ, in Christ, the faster you should grow spiritually. The faster you should press on spiritually. The older you are in Christ, the faster you should grow, the faster you should mature spiritually. And this is an important point for us, which means that we cannot afford to rest. And that's why the apostle says, I forget those things which are behind. Because we know that one of the big limitations to growth in any aspect of life is complacency. At the point where you stop and you regard all that you've accomplished. And like the, you know, the rich fool says, soul, you have accomplished. Now let's take a rest. That is the greatest limitation to growth in any way where you become complacent. When you look at your own achievements and you just start reveling and celebrating and resting in that. So Apostle Paul tells us that he actually forgets. He forgets all that is behind him, all that he has accomplished. And he presses onward. So let us continue to press onward in spiritual growth. Let us let our roots grow deeper in Christ. Let it grow faster even as we mature more in Christ. And the second point here from the passage, I'll read in verse 15 of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 15. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if anything you think, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. You know, I, here I, I, I see a promise I see a promise here that also goes with the continual growth. The promise here that I read in this verse is that Apostle Paul is saying that even when you think differently, in other words, when you have errors in your doctrinal knowledge. Apostle Paul has his own doctrinal knowledge. And of course, we know that over the history of church, there are always differences on one doctrinal issue or the other. In fact, that's why we have as many denominations as you can count in the Christian world. The points of division are always on some doctrinal issue or the other. And Apostle Paul recognizes that here. And of course, the point of doc doctrinal issue is actually always fiercest with mature Christians. Have you noticed that? It's only when people are very, I've read the Bible for 50 years and I'm very strong about my opinion on this issue. Because maybe Christians don't argue so much on doctrinal issues. They have a sense that, well, you know what, mm, I'm not sure, you know, yeah, I just read it, I don't understand. Doctrinal issues are fiercest, the division is fiercest among mature Christians. And that's why Apostle Paul is saying that here. He's saying, yes, for us who are mature, if in anything you think otherwise from me, God himself will reveal to you. Now, what is the point here? The point here is that our area of spiritual growth Growing in Christ means that our doctrinal errors can be corrected by God himself. I know that when I started studying the Bible, when I started growing in Christ, there were certain things that I believed in, there were certain understandings that I had that over time I have come to understand better. And this is not just true for me. This is true even for the early church. In the early church, the earliest days of the early church, the early church had two big misunderstandings of Scripture. The first one was that scripture that the salvation was not for the Gentiles. And this was why when Peter went into the house of Cornelius, he faced severe criticism from the church. Not from sinners, from the church. From the elders of the church. They did not think that salvation was for the Gentiles. And the second point we can see in the book of Acts is that they also they were wrong on the point on the importance of circumcision, physical circumcision. And that caused a big fierce dispute 
So even them, even these were the people who had the Pentecost had come upon them. The Holy Spirit had fallen upon them. Even they had to still be perfected in terms of their doctrinal knowledge. How much more you and I? And so it's in the process of growing, studying your scriptures, start meditating on scripture, because I don't know any other way that your doctrinal errors can be corrected, except when you are studying the scripture and the Holy Spirit speaks to you. It's not going to be in your, in, your, in your life experience. Your life experience is only just going to make you double down on what you believe in, more often than not. But it's only in reading the scripture, and as Apostle Paul points out here, it's not any man that will correct you. It's God himself will reveal to you what the errors of your ways. And so this is one of the reasons why we need, even as mature Christians, to continue to grow. Let us not underestimate or grow complacent about the power of the scripture to transform even our own lives. To perfect us. Because we all have our errors. Apostle Paul says that we, we know in part, we prophesy in part. That's true for all of us. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So even as we com- conclude, the admonition is for us to be rooted in Christ. Let us continue to grow into Christ. Let us recognize that it's in Christ that we have all that we need for godly living. It is only in Christ that we can attain all that we, get, we need to please God with our lives. We cannot do it of our own. And being rooted in Christ helps us to withstand all the heresies, all the plots of Satan to steal us away from the true and living God. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Even before we start praying, I want us to just spend a moment to reflect on ourselves and ask God to help us. In any way, you may have grown complacent even in your spiritual growth, in my spiritual growth. Let us pray for the Lord to have mercy upon us. Anyway, I may have slackened, O Lord, please have mercy. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Lord God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, because your word reveals your will and your mind to us, O God. We thank you, Lord, because your word, not a thought or jot of it, will fall to the ground void, O Lord. And so, Father, Lord, even as we receive your word today, O Lord, we receive it with faith, with expectation that your word will perform a work even in our lives, a work of transformation and renewing of our minds so that we can be more like Christ. Lord, we pray that even these words will not stand against us on the day of judgment, but rather these words, by these words, O Lord, we will grow to be more and more like Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we pray that will be our testimony. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Let's share the grace and fellowship, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we should dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord.